Managing Director of Sports Pro, yeah, go Nick Meacham. Thank you, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rachel. I'm just getting a, a chair brought in. Maybe you guys uh, sit, you sit to, next to each other. I'll take this seat here. You'll take this seat. Get the big light beamed into my eyeballs. <laughs> Good stuff. We got there. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. This should be a, a really fun conversation. Let's call it fun. Um, but basically, we're here to talk quite a few things around the broadcasting space. I just realized that my back of my head's right in, right in the shot there, so hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, we're going to talk about quite, quite a few things today. I think the, the, the name of the, the session was Maximizing the Broadcast Opportunity. We're going to start talking a little bit more about each respective organization, and then we're going to dig into sort of the right side and then and sort of take things from there. But uh, Charlie, Executive Vice President of Sport for Sky Sports Deutschland. Um, for those that did know, Sky Sports Deutschland also sits across uh, three markets, if I'm not mistaken, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Nailed that, good. You've, you've been with the company for about 12 months, and pr prior to that was at ESPN for the best part of 13 years, if I remember correctly. And, and Sophie Vuma, who is ex Vice President of Broadcast and Media Rights, heads up all the, the broadcast rights side at the IOC, quite a big job. Um, you've been with the company quite a long time as well. I can't remember how long, but it's over a decade. 13 days, 13 years, yeah. 13 years, so quite, quite a decent, uh, decent stint there for sure. So plenty to dig into. And Sophie, let's start with you. Um, I think it might just be good to set the scene on what, very simply, what are the IOC's assets that they play with from a, from a broadcast and digital perspective? Because obviously you have the Olympic Channel and so forth. So how does that all piece together? I think, well, first, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be uh, with you today uh, physically and not uh, through a screen. So thank you for, uh, for having me, uh, Nick, and uh, Sports Pro OTT Summit. Um, yeah, well, you know, obviously what comes to mind immediately for everyone is uh, the Olympic Games, uh, you know, being the pinnacle of, of, uh, of uh, events that uh, the IOC has in, in its portfolio. And, and as, you know, years went by, I think we've complemented, you know, the Olympic Games with several different uh, properties like the Youth Olympic Games where you could see more sort of the future champions and, and, you know, regularly we have a lot of the champions that have medaled in the Youth than make it to uh, the Olympic Games uh, themselves. Um, but, but also, uh, as you rightly pointed out, we've, we've developed um, a more bespoke digital strategy. Um, and it started with the creation of the Olympic Channel. Uh, a few years ago, in, in 2016, we launched just that uh, at the end uh, of, the, of the Rio 2016 Games. And, and this has been really our first attempt to have a direct-to-consumer uh, proposition and and we felt at the time really really important when um, and it was so apparent in Rio when you know you come back from the uh, closing ceremony and you've been you know um, you know living the games on television and all sorts of different platforms on a constant nearly 24/7 basis and then the flame goes down and you go back to your hotel and you look at the channels and it's all back to football or volleyball or whatever and it's gone and we wanted to continue the journey and and you know one of the motto we used at the time is because 17 days is not enough um, and it was really the purpose of bringing um, you know the Olympic fans continuing to feed them with their passion for the Olympic movement and bridging the gap between those two moments, uh, they have to wait two or four years, depending on whether it's summer or and, and, and winter. And we really tried to uh, to uh, to do this through the creation of the Olympic Channel. Yeah, and it's, it's a fascinating project. I think, if I remember correctly, a six or seven year project now in place. Budget around 600 million uh, was uh, was touted out afterwards. It's now been integrated more into the Olympics.com uh, platform. Uh, from what I remember, if I, I spoke to Mark Parkman, who's, who runs that, runs that project, um, and he talked about there's something like 95 federation partnerships in place where you're actually helping uh, sports broadcast their live events. So it's not just about the Olympics, it's about the whole, the whole sports uh, ecosystem. Um, and I think you're coming towards that point now where that first seven years is up, right? So there obviously a lot of considerations going on around what's, what's in store for the Olympics channel. Um, 
We'll dig into that a bit later on, actually. Let's, let's go to Charlie now. Talk a bit more about, again, Sky Deutschland's, I guess, key assets, or what platforms and panels you're using uh, primarily. Well, our key assets are obviously the sports rights portfolio. For instance, on a Saturday afternoon where you can watch five Bundesliga games in parallel, we produce a conference program already. Now you can choose, actually, I only want to see these three matches. So how do you make that period better? But it's all about... A fa sports fan is a sports fan seven days a week. So how do we engage people the whole week? And actually Sky Sports News is the channel on the Sky platform in Germany that's watched the most regularly but of all the channels that exist, including all the entertainment channels. So people come back a lot. And what channels do you have on Sky Deutschland specifically for sports? How many? So it's not a straightforward question. <laughs> I, I, I think. figured by your reaction. <laughs> Um, so we have um, five dedicated channels, and then we have about 18 occasional channels. Okay. So on a Saturday afternoon, we may have 20 concurrent events happening at the same time, and then we reduce it down to between four and six on the normal time. And those five dedicated channels, uh, in Sky Sports in the UK, they have dedicated channels for single sports coverage. Do you have the same? So we do have a dedicated Formula One channel, then we have a Bundesliga channel, and then we have a general sports channel and Sky News channel. So we haven't quite got exactly the same format as we have in the UK. Um, and we constantly look at it, but actually increasingly what we're trying to do is move to a position where we do have branded propositions, whether it's the Formula One channel, and we don't just think about a linear channel, mm -hmm. it's actually also how do you, and there's kind of the second pillar, it's kind of the home of sports, how do you unite all the amazing Formula One content in one home? So you have a linear channel, you have all the on-demand assets, but also we aggregate, whether it's Drive to Survive, uh, a Senna, or the Mick Schumacher documentary that Netflix has done, um, so how do you get everything in one place to make it easier for the fan? Um, and the last pillar we have as a force for good is how do we actually use our assets to actually do something useful, but we'll talk about that later. The traditional channels you've got in place, what are you doing from a digital and OTT standpoint? Are they replicated? Are you doing things differently? You know, we've seen obviously in the US, your partner, your, your Comcast obviously owned, NBC have made, made their own move with Peacock, and uh, every other broadcaster has basically made some sort of move in that space. Are you, are you just replicating what you've got through tr your traditional channels at the moment? So we, in the traditional broadcast space, we have two main businesses. We have the traditional pay TV business, and then we have a GT, Sky Ticket, Now TV in the UK, the equivalent, um, where we replicate the normal linear channels, plus lots of on-demand content. And people sometimes talk down linear channels these days. If we actually look at the consumption Streaming is going up, and streaming will include both the OTT proposition as well as SkyGo proposition. For the Bundesliga, last season to this year, it's gone up from 14 to 21 percent of consumption of the streaming. For Premier League, it's closer to a third in Germany, but it still means between two thirds and four fifths are viewed on traditional linear channels. Mm. Having said that, actually being out in the social space is incredibly important to us. So we have the largest social reach in Germany in sports, partly for storytelling, because actually, again, fans are fans all the time, not just in the live window, but it's also from a brand marketing perspective being associated with sports. Um, and then by each platform, you have to adapt your storytelling depending on what platform you are and who you're talking to and when, and we heard from Man City Certain things like YouTube actually works quite well for long form. TikTok, you have to be very different highlights. So you, you have to be fairly agile. And so V, we, we were talking a bit earlier about... Uh um, forces in markets uh, uh, tend to move quite quickly. So we need to have uh, sort of intelligence about whether it's a specific territory or, or, or a region to understand uh, you know, who, who are who are the best uh, possible partners that we could be uh, we could be uh, engaging discussions with and, and and we do this not only you know of course revenue is important because uh, we we uh, we are funding and and 
and uh, distributing 90% of the revenues that the IOC uh, generates and, and the broadcast uh, revenues are uh, uh, today the, the, the most important part of those, uh, those revenues. And, and, but of course, we also want to make sure that you know, when we analyze this market, we understand you know, whether the partner can be for us, A, we often go long term, um, which, you know, in these days where, um, you know, nobody has a crystal ball as to where uh, the industry is going into a certain extent, we see a lot of moving forces at the moment and some tectonic plates, you know, being, being uh, moving a little bit. So, so we do have to um, look at markets thinking who is the best partner for us to take us through all those years that we're willing to be uh, contracting, uh, contracting with. And, and it's a market by market or region by region uh, an, an analysis. And, and, and for sure, sometimes you have to be patient <laughs> um, because you don't find the right, uh, you know, it's not the right time or, or you don't have the right mix of, uh, of partners that you could be uh, working with. And sometimes you just have to grab the, uh, the momentum. If there is a momentum that is being created, then you just have to grab that momentum. Are, are you seeing now the conversation has, has it shifted a lot over the last few years? Are people asking for more depth in those rights, but also additionally, um, there's more fragmentation happening. Uh, are they becoming more and more complex deals to, 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 to do because of that segmentation versus flexibility because of the, the shifting uh, tides we're seeing in, in consumption trends? Yeah, you, it, it's um, clearly those discussions are more complex because uh, I think the, the, the way um, we are looking at monetization and the way um, and that's maybe a, a question for Charlie. Don't worry, he's getting it. Don't how how rights-holding uh, uh, broadcasters are looking at monetization uh, and, and what's the value within a partnership uh, may differ. So, of course, there's the revenue element that is, that, that is an important one, but it's also about is this partner going to uh, continue to um, provide the reach that uh, the Olympic Games are uh, traditionally providing uh, to an audience in a particular region or, or, or territory. Um, but also in addition, is this partner, and uh, Nouria, I think, was saying, we want to go beyond the 90 minute. Um, we definitely want to go beyond the 17 days, because when the flame goes down, all those athletes and all those stories need to, be, need to continue to be told. And uh, we're more and more looking at partners that can be with us along this journey in order to bridge the gap between games um, mm. so that you don't have to wait for two or four years uh, you know, between the summer or, or, or winter uh, before you can be following your preferred athletes uh, 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 along the way. And so we've shift, seen a, a big shift, I suppose, in the about the, the, the Olympics the next time that one comes around. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, I would say that the focus of the conversation is usually the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. um, for sure. And, and, and those are sort of, if you look at how we would be analyzing, you know, the, the, the what's the value of partnering with X, Y, and Z, um, you of course have the, the Olympic Games at the center, and then how they can help us telling that journey uh, you know, through a wider or, or, or broaden the shoulders of the halo of the Olympic Games is certainly an element that, uh, that, is, uh, that is an important aspect of, uh, of how, we, uh, how we choose our partners. So Charlie, from your perspective, you're in a big business. Um, sports is a big part of the sports and entertainment product and the proposition you're, you're delivering. From your point of view, you've only been with the company for a, uh, about, a, about a year now, but do you get a sense that sports rights values and, and what you, you're able to extract out of it as a broadcaster is going up or is it actually is it flat, flat now or, or dipping? Because there's, there's a bit of a conjecture as to what sports' role now is in was competing in terms of whether entertainment pro 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 properties, esports, and so on and so forth. What's your take on that and how you guys... Uh, not only, I guess there's probably two... One actually related to that is, 
the, the overall value and how you extract value out of it, if that makes sense, in terms of how you're using those rights, are they, is that also changing? So you're doing more to get more value out of the deal, or is it largely business as usual? I, I don't think business as usual exists anymore. The, the industry is changing so fast, so we do evolve a lot. A couple of things. I mean, if I look at the number of sports subscribers we have today versus 12 months ago, we have more so sports subscribers now. Um, you see the growth on OTT being quicker than other platforms. So we're generating more value from it. You mentioned entertainment. Actually, the way we see to grow our sports subscriptions is to invest more in entertainment, which may be slightly counterintuitive for some. That's also a fairly German specific thing for us where Sky's been known as a sports platform. Where we see the biggest headroom is those households who want sports and entertainment. So we're investing hundreds of millions in strengthening our entertainment platform that will ultimately also watch sports and then head in your headroom. In terms of our traditional valuation of sports rights, it's yes, we look at our residential subscriptions of so, uh, pay TV, then OTT, then we look at advertising, we look at um, commercial premises business, um, and obviously we're always looking at I'm not going to do an NFTs now, um, but it's constantly evolving. But those are the four biggest revenue streams. So the monetization piece, uh, and Sophie sort of touched upon it before, and we, I, I even talked about a little bit in the presentation side, is the traditional model of driving revenue through a subscription product. Yours is a little bit different because it's been so established. Is that still? That, I'm guessing that's still the primary. But uh, how much are you invested into building out alternative revenue streams across the, the wider offering? So, as I said, the Sky Ticket, our OTT, is our fastest growing platform, so we're very much investing in that area. Mm -hmm. The other very big advantage we have is, as you say, is the established base of subscribers that we have. And I suppose one of the things we have evolved over the last couple of years, that we're leaning into aggregation. And of your 10 lessons, I think your ninth was piracy. And one of the reasons it's it's so complicated, it's so fragmented. So on Sky Q, we're actually taking all our sports from Sky Sports, plus we're integrating DAZN, Amazon, we'll have Magenta Sports in Germany, making it easy for the fan to get all the content by one proposition. Because who, if you want to watch Man City, to go back to the example, they play in different competitions probably four different competitions. And how do you remember where they are all? So if you can take out the complexity, you also address some of the piracy issues. Mm -hmm. And by the way, by having the platforms for the most sports fans that are already paying, we're a really interesting partner for third parties mm -hmm. to get to our subscribers, which becomes a new revenue stream. Um, so, so you talked about, uh, you gave an example of the zone and there's other, other uh, networks you've partnered with, um, a lot of uh, sort of Organizations have come into the market to, to try and build a, their own, in, own, own platform. We've seen similar in the UK as well. How do you get to a point where you're able to go from you guys are c complete competitors there to uh, for, for big premium rights to actually let's work together on this? Like I can see the common goods, but that must be a tough conversation to, to work through. Well, th these conversations are highly regulated. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately, we look at what are rights worth to us mm -hmm. as a platform. And then we will bid prudently to what things are worth for us. Um, but I mean, many of you will know that th as of this season, we don't have Champions League rights in Germany anymore. We lost some Bundesliga rights. DAZN invested a lot. We've taken Formula One exclusively. So we adapted our portfolio. And that has worked. We've got more subscribers than we had a year ago. Um, the, the world where everyone has this set all rights has gone. Yeah. You have to live in a fragmented world. So we have to focus on creating the best live rights, creating the best experience around it, and then making it easy for someone else. And actually, the one area that I'm really excited about is Sky launching Sky Glass, which launched in the UK and is coming to Germany and the other markets next year. And taking that simplicity and the aggregation to the next level. It's a TV, no cable, no satellite, plug it in, and it's a beautiful interface. And actually, we're launching a camera on top of it, which that opens up a whole different, A, engagement, mm. but also a platform for new business models. 
So being able to watch viewing parties to, and, and we're only at the start of this journey. So being able to go, okay, I'm going to watch Hamburg, my team. I'll be able to virtually put the Hamburg kit on. Um, and then if I watch it against St. Pauli in the derby, um, what, what, what niceties do I uh, send my St. Pauli fans? Though unfortunately we always lose these days. Um, it's very depressing, but it's a different topic. So it's a whole new world that's opening up, yeah. um, both for us and for third parties, which is really exciting. So we talked about fragmentation of rights. Let's dig into that a little bit more. From the IOC's perspective, you, most of your deals are pretty, con pretty considerate. You don't have a lot of fragmentation in the major markets, at least from what I understand. What do you think that's going to look like in the future? Are you going to, if, if that, is that accurate? Ha and do you think you're going to start looking to create more fragmentation in those rights? Because we've had examples where, um, let's say, Discovery have the, the, sub, uh, have the rights across, uh, across Europe. Um, keep nodding if I'm, I'm, and shake your head if I get this wrong. They've, sub they've got all the rights. They sub-license into certain markets. If from 2018, they put the Winter Olympics uh, via Discovery Direct instead of Linear um, in most of those markets. And the Summer Olympics just gone. They've now gone direct to consumer uh, with their own Discovery Plus platform. So if you want to watch the Olympics, there was some content on Linear, but uh, I think it was two, up to two concurrents, and the rest was all sitting on Discovery. Do you expect to see more of that happening where you'll be suddenly, let's say, splicing and dicing for want of a better description, your rights to make sure uh, monetization improves, reach improves, and so on? So there's, there's one generic and the specifics of your, your, your question. On, on, on the more generic uh, aspect, yeah, it's true that most of our deals are what we call gatekeeper deals, where one you know, um, entity uh, acquires all the rights for that specific territory. Um, what we have seen uh, and what we do allow um, and we see more and more, and it was very, very apparent in, in, in Tokyo, is that before all those gatekeeper rights holding broadcasters would exploit those rights mainly on their own platform. And, you know, rightly so, you could imagine that they said we've made a big investment and we want those rights to be benefiting our own platforms. And, and, and today, I think um, consumers expect more than that. Uh, they expect, um, I think, Charlie, you were saying you have to make it easy for the consumer, but they you really have to make it easy because it's not obvious that people will just come and watch anymore. So um, it's not enough to just keep it on your own platform. And we've seen many of our uh, broadcast partners actually seek, I would say, expanded distribution through not only their own platform, obviously on digital, and most of our broadcasters have actually put the entirety of the games also on their own digital platforms, but also we've seen deals with YouTube, with uh, with Amazon, with uh, I can see my friend Callan here, uh, with with Snap and 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 others, where by deciding and then that broadcaster needs to make its own decision about how much stays on my platform, how much do I uh, uh, license uh, to a third-party platform, do I license. Um, clips, non-live, do I license live, but we do enable those broadcasters to make those decisions for what works best for their own, uh, their own territory. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. If there is any questions from the audience, I'm going to try and see through this beaming light. And I think we might even have a Slido app going on somewhere where you can uh, ask questions if you're too scared to put your hand up. But I'm going to quick fire a couple of other questions before we get to the end. Uh, Olympic Channel, as we talked about, it's, it's seven years in. Um, I believe you have gone, uh, you have broadcast some of the, the, la the last Olympics on the Olympic Channel, if I'm not mistaken, in a market? Is that okay? in, in one, of, one of the markets? The one, of, one of the markets is India, um, yeah. where we're in, uh, back in uh, already from 2018, we've used, and, and it's really a question of you know, using your own technology and your own platform. Uh, you've mentioned, I think, in one of your, uh, your opening points, you know, the, the direct-to-consumer proposition where, yeah, it is true. If you have a market where um, you believe that uh, you're better suited uh, in, in exploiting those rights on your own platform, then we're able to do that. And we're able to do that if you own the platform, then you have the agility to just switch on and say, you know what, we've been trying to cover, and we always look for a global um, 220 plus 
territories that uh, that we cover, but it could be that, uh, and I'm just making this up, but you need Bhutan has, you know, we've struggled to uh, find a broadcast in Bhutan. You can switch on Bhutan and, and, and then the Olympic fans there would be able to enjoy, uh, to enjoy the game. So for sure it has been a, a, a very important tool for us that will continue to develop, um, but the strategy is mainly to be able to, well, taking it from the Olympic Channel, which was a channel to create, to, to entertain, we've now elevated to a, I would say, much broader digital strategy, which is um, we believe that we need to be here, uh, not only in between games time, but also during games time, and offering the one-stop shop place where every Olympic fan can go and you can have results content, uh, medals uh, and, and, and everything you want, including we work with our broadcast partners to actually direct uh, those fans uh, to where to watch. If you want to go deeper, uh, you need more than medals and, and, uh, and, and results uh, and, and athletes bio, then please go watch you know, on NBC or on BBC or on Discovery, etc. etc. So we use the platform for both, uh, for both means. So yeah, watch our broadcasters. Could be going direct to consumer in all your markets <laughs> if you don't bid the right price. Um, <laughs> we're going to get oh, oh, interesting. T you said in the introduction. Yeah. If you look at the main territories, you see the opposite trend. Mm. Yeah. And there's a reason. Yeah. We still pay a lot of money for those rights. Absolutely. Um, so we've got about two minutes left. Is there anyone who's got their hand up? I can't see. Kieran. Yeah. Yep. Uh, have we got a mic for Kieran? He's got a booming <laughs> voice, so we'll just go with that. Let's go with that. Go, go yeah, on. Charlie gave a great stat. Um, digital consumption is between a fifth and a third. Uh, and Sophia, what if you have the same thing for major markets for the Olympic Games? Between TV and digital? Yes. Yeah, well, we're still you know, crunching number for Tokyo, but the trend is that digital consumption has more than doubled, um, but still represents under 10% of people who have consumed only on digital. But what has grown is the proportion of people that have consumed on both. Um, so major of the consumption has been on both, on TV and digital, and but a, a, a growth in the number of people that have consumed only on digital. So interesting uh, development. Uh, you, you know, it, it's uh, Charlie. You were saying, you know, the the linear world. Um, still, at least it has confirmed for us in Tokyo, delivers, um, I would say, the vast majority of, uh, of the reach uh, today, even though you have all the content on digital platforms. We were talking about this earlier, and also from my ESPN experience, what we found is you have to offer all of them, and the, those fans who engage on digital and television will watch more on television and on digital. And is giving people, engaging them as much as possible means they become much better viewers across all your platforms. Okay. So it's growing rapidly, but it's only one part. And actually, interestingly, we aggregate to Zone in Germany. We offer two linear channels, which is one of the key selling points for people that people want the linear channels. I mean, yes, Netflix has luckily changed the consumption, and by the way, is increasing people's willingness to pay. So really helps. But it doesn't mean the linear world is dead. It's no. surprisingly stubborn. Yeah. If, you, if you look at what would be interesting in the future is if you represent this in Venn diagram of you know, bubbles, you see the center being the intersection of both being about two thirds of the consumption today for the reach for us today. Um, how those diagram will move you know, from, will linear continue to lose to digital only, you know, time will tell, but uh, for sure for us today, the two thirds or, or nearly two thirds of uh, the reach has come from both people consuming on television and digital. Television it still represents um, about three times what television only, people who have consumed on only on television, still represents about three times what people have consumed on digital only but the vast majority sit in the middle. Yeah. I think that's a good spot to wrap things up. The clock has struck zero. A big thank you to Charlie and Anne-Sophie. Thank you.